In the next few lectures, we're going to look at how OpenCL program is mapped into FPGAs. We are going to use the training materials released by Intel's engineering team. We acknowledge the contribution of Intel's engineering team for releasing the training materials on these topics. First, we will introduce the basics of FPGAs. First, we're going to introduce the basics of programmable logic, and specifically, we're going to look into FPGA's architecture. So why do people use programmable logic? Given a particular device, chances are you will have new functionalities that will be needed to add to this device. And also, you would like to retain the high performance in your data processing tasks. The foundations of FPGAs are the programmable logics, which can be reprogrammed to implement new functionalities. Also, the advantage of FPGAs is direct access to data through massive amount of IOs. Also, it has advantages of convenient connection to uh, memory components such as flash, SD-RAM, as well as coprocessors such as DSPs. So with FPGA, you can replace the functionalities on this device without needing to replace the hardware. In fact, you can find programmable logic everywhere. In consumer devices, automotive applications, you can find FPGAs in entertainment devices, in navigation systems. In test, measurement, and medical applications, you can find FPGAs in medical instrumentation devices and manufacturing uh, facilities. In communication and broadcast industry, uh, a lot of FPGAs are being used in cellular base stations, wireless lines, switches, and routers. In military and industrial applications, you can find FPGAs in radars, in uh, control systems, etc. And very recently, in computing and storage devices, you can also find FPGAs in servers, uh, in RAID controllers, in printers, etc. So we start by introducing FPGA's logic blocks. FPGA's logic is made up of logic elements. And on top of that, you can also find adaptive logic modules that are available in Intel FPGAs. This diagram illustrates an adaptive logic module. And we're going to start by looking at this uh, small part of it. This is what we call lookup table. Lookup table is a table that you can uh, configure or program to define logic functions. There are other important parts of this logic, for example, carry chain, registers, and we will talk about these other parts in the next few slides. First, the lookup tables. Lookup tables can be used to implement combinational functions through cascaded multiplexers. We can think about the lookup table as a series of multiplexers. And these, the inputs to the lookup table are the multiplexers select lines. Let's use this diagram to illustrate this structure. A, B, C, D are four inputs to this lookup table. And within this lookup table, we have a number of multiplexers. Uh, each multiplexer in this lookup table takes one input as its select line. For example, this multiplexer has A as the select line to select one of these two inputs. If A is zero, then the output of this multiplexer will be the input on input 0. If A is 1, then the output of this multiplexer will be the one on the input 1. At the very bottom, these are the input values we can program in FPGA's WEPROM or SRAM. And each box here is represented using R, a register, which can take a value 0 or 1. These registers are inputs to the first level multiplexers. 
and we have eight of them in this case. And this A is one of the inputs to LUT, the lookup table. And A is the select line for all these first level multiplexers. And the output of these first level multiplexers are inputs to the second level multiplexers. Now we have four of them. And this B is another input to this lookup table. And B is the select line to these four multiplexers. And similarly, we have another level of multiplexer, and C is the set line of this level of multiplexers. Finally, at the top, we have the final multiplexer, and the D, the other input to this lookup table, is the select line. Now, using this A, B, C, D, we can, in fact, select one of the input values from the registers as the output of this lookup table. If you learn basics of logic design, you know that we can use the inputs of this lookup table to build a logic function. We can use the input values in these registers to build a arbitrary combinational logic. For example, if we have a hexadecimal value 9889, so if you write this number in binary, you have 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1 in these 16 registers. Then use the input to this LUT, we can derive the output of this lookup table. And the output will be A bar, B bar, or A, B, C bar, D bar, or A, B, C, D. And this A, B, C, D, uh, these are uh, logic and operations. If you are not familiar with logic design, let's see if we have a 1 on this particular bit, then the output from this max will be A. Because if A is 0, then we're going to take this input 0, which is a 0. And if A is 1, we're going to be, uh, we will um, take this input, then the, the output will be a 1. So the, the output from this max is A. Similarly, the output from this max is B, and then for this one, the output will be C bar, and for this one, the output will be D bar. So that's in fact uh, the second term here. So as a result, we can use these 16-bit values to define a arbitrary combinational logic that takes four inputs, A, B, C, D. Programmable register. Registers are the storage elements within a PGA that we often use to form counters, shipped registers, state machines, and DSP functions. They are basically anything that can require us to store a value between clock edges. These registers, their clocks typically are driven by global clock. Like so, here we have a register, and the clock signal is coming from uh, the clock enable logic, which takes in global clocks. There are asynchronous control through other logic or I.O. Like here, we have asynchronous clear reset and load logic that will control part of the register. The registers can feed back into the uh, lookup tables. So uh, here we have the output from the register that can feed back into the input of the lookup table. The output from the logic can also bypass the registers or LUTs and going out to another logic element. Logic elements and adaptive logic modules are connected from one to another through chain signals. Their carry bits can be chained between logic elements. And for that, we have this uh, carry in uh, that comes from a previous logic element or logic adaptive logic module. And then it goes through the arithmetic uh, compute unit. And the output of the compute will be going out to the next logic element. Likewise, the input to registers can be coming from previous logic element, uh, like so. 
and it goes into a synchronous load clear logic, which can be one of the inputs to the register. And the register output can be then used for the chain output that will be fed into the next logic element. And we can separate the outputs from the lookup tables and registers to create two outputs from one logic element, like so. So in this way, we can have more outputs from one logic element. As a result, we can use these output lines as additional inputs or outputs in order to save the overall resource utilization on a PGA device. Here is a big picture of how FPGAs organize the logic elements inside the chip. Each of this rectangular box is a logic array block, or LAB. Each LAB consists of 10 adaptive logic modules with various carry chains, shared arithmetic, local interconnect, and register chain connections. And each of this adaptive logic is showing here that includes lookup tables and carry logic, as we described earlier, plus registers that can store data per clock cycle. Adaptive logic module is Intel FPGA's specific design that includes not only logic elements, but also it includes dedicated resources and adaptive lookup table, or ALUT. As shown in this figure, in the adaptive logic module, there's an adaptive lookup table, which can flexibly organize the inputs and generate a specific number of outputs. Also in this adaptive logic module, it includes a few adders to perform arithmetic operation, and the results can be stored in a number of registers. With the adaptive logic modules, the Intel PGAs can improve performance and resource utilization. Overall, on the FPGA chip, there are logic array blocks that are arranged in an array. We connect these logic array blocks through row and column interconnect. We can program the interconnect to connect specific row and column. Also, the interconnect may span to all or parts of the array. For example, on this diagram, we have the uh, row interconnect that can connect the, all the logic array blocks on a specific row. Similarly, for column, we can have column interconnect. In certain regions, we can have a segmented interconnect, which will reach a smaller number of logic array blocks. On FPGA, all devices' resources can be fed into or be fed by any routing on a device. And for the routing, we can see different fixed lengths and as a result to achieve different timing delays. And the routing scales linearly as the density of the device increases. We have local interconnect that connects between logic elements and adaptive logic modules within a logic array block. Also, local interconnect includes direct connections between adjacent logic array blocks. To connect logic array blocks in a wider distance, we can use row and column interconnect, which may have fixed length routing segments. FPGA has embedded memory on the chip. These memory blocks create on chip memory structures to support the design. The memory has different types, single or dual port RAM, read-only memory, or simply shift registers or FIFO buffers. We can initialize RAM and ROM contents on power on. We can also have specific memory logic array blocks, or called MLABs, which are small slices of memory structures. The typical sizes of memory structures on FPGA may be single memory blocks that's about 20 kilobits, or the smaller M labs, which is about 640 bits. On the right side, we can see the, the signals for these memory blocks. 
we see the typical address lines, data input, and data output. We also have a clock signal along with the write enable signal. And for this particular example, we, uh, we have a dual port memory. So that's why you see the address B, data input, data output for the B side. Also with the write enable and the clock signal for the second port. On FPGA, there are certain built-in DSP blocks or digital signal processing blocks. They are useful for DSP functions, for example, FFT transformation. They can achieve very high performance multiply, add, accumulate operations, which are optimized for signal processing. In this particular example, we have a DSP block that performs coefficient computations, and also you can use intermediate multiplexers to implement more complex operations. In the latest Intel FPGA family, such as Area 10, the chip has 32-bit floating point support. This Area 10 DSP block can do 32-bit IEEE compliant floating point multiply and addition operation. Just like logic array blocks, DSP blocks can be chained to implement larger operations such as dot products. The, in this example of DSP block, we have the floating point multiply and addition operation supported here. And we can take the accumulation um, value from this accumulate input along with X, Y, and Z inputs. And uh, we can perform multiplication on Y and Z and pass along this product to this floating point addition or subtraction operator. And then the, the intermediate product can be added to this accumulation inputs and generate the output. Also, this DSP block can take uh, chain inputs and generate chain output to connect to other DSP blocks. FPGA can talk to a variety of I.O. elements. We can connect advanced programmable logic blocks to the I.O. components through row and column interconnects. We can control available I.O. features that include input and output or bidirectional. We can implement multiple I.O. standards. We can implement also differential signaling to ensure the integrity of the sig signal traveling through a long path. We can also control the current drive strength, the slew rate of signals, and also on-chip termination and plug resistors, and open drain and tri-state, etc. We'll look at some of the examples in the next few slides. This is a typical I.O. element logic. So on the very left side, these are the logic arrays that FPGA's logic, that FPGA's programmable logic will be able to control. So the signals we are controlling include output enable, output clock, and output A and B for the signal output, and also the input, the clock driving input. Let's take a look at the input first. So this is the device pin that will be connected to other electronic components um, outside the FPGA. If we use this pin, first of all, this pin can be bidirectional. And we use the output enable to control whether this is going to be used as input or output. If the output enable is enabled, so that means we want to use this as a output pin. Then the output path takes effect. The output values A and B will be selected uh, through this clock signal. And they, the value will be generated through this output signal to the device pin. If the output control is disabled, that means we want to use this pin as an input pin then we will disable this output path 
through this control signal, and the input signals will be fed into this input register through this clock input, and the output of this input register will be read into this programmable logic at the next clock edge. High-speed transceivers. High-speed transceivers are very useful for the FPGA to implement more complex signal protocols to be able to communicate with other devices. And these protocols, for example, include Ethernet, PCI Express, etc. These protocols often involve a large number of signals, and the timing sequence of these signals are well defined through the specifications of these protocols. To make it easier for the FPGA developers to connect to these devices using standard protocols, the FPGA vendors often provide these high-speed transceivers, which can be easily programmed to support these specific protocols. As a result, the FPGA programmer does not have to deal with these complex signal conditioning and processing to support such protocols. Clock signals are important signals in FPGA. There are dedicated input clock pins typically to support these FPGA's proper operation. Inside FPGA, we can change or configure these clock signals to generate different frequencies or phases. The component we use are often called phased locked loops or PLLs. There can also be delayed locked loops, which will dynamically phase shift the strokes for external memory interfaces. On the FPGA, there are also control blocks for controlling clock signals and also routing networks specifically for routing clock signals. PLLs are based on input clock. We can program the block to generate different clock signals for use throughout the device with minimal skew. So instead of using simple flip-flop registers, we use dedicated PLL so that we can change the frequency of a signal, for example, in this case, 100 MHz input clock. Using different configuration parameters, we can generate a, another 100 MHz clock, or even a 200 MHz clock, or a 90 degree phase shifted 200 MHz clock signal for the other programmable logics on the, on the same FPGA chip. To program the FPGA, we often use SRAM cell technology to program the interconnect and lookup tables. For example, we use the values in the SRAM bit to configure the row and column routing interconnect. In this example, we, we have six programmable bits that can be configured to control the connectivity of these four signals, inputs and outputs. To change this programming status, we can use the program enable bit so that we can so we can choose whether the FPGA is in the programmable status or is it is in the operating status. If this programmable bit is enabled, we will update the values of these programmable bits through this uh, input. Note that these um, the FPGAs should be programmed at power on status. That's when we will enable this program bit so that we can populate the proper program bits into the FPGA's programmable memory. FPGA's programming information must be stored somewhere to program the device at power on. Typically, people use external EEPROM, CPLD, or CPU to program the FPGAs. As a result, there are two programming methods we can use. We can allow, we can ask the FPGA to control the programming sequence automatically at power on, and this is called active mode. Or we can have another processor, typically a CPU, to control the programming of the FPGAs, and that's called passive mode. Alternatively, we can program through a special hardware via JTAG connection. And in this case, we have the opportunity to do further diagnosis and debug. 
Overall, we, sh we show the FPGA full chip architecture in this diagram. First of all, we can see that we have certain configuration information that should be programmed into an FPGA at power on state or by a host processor at runtime. And inside FPGA, the majority of the area is the logic array blocks uh, that can be connected through the row and column interconnects. And among the other blocks, we have uh, PLLs, we have transceivers that we can program to connect to outside components. And we have memory controller that can be connected to other memory components. Here's an example of resource accounts for the latest Intel IPJ Area 10 GX. And it has about 1 million logic elements that include 1.7 million registers about and 1 million for input LUTs. It consists of 54,000 memory blocks and each has 20 k bits. Also on the chip, there are 1,518 DSP blocks. It has 36 7.4 gigabits per second transceivers, which can be programmed for different purposes. It also includes two hard PCIe blocks which can be used to connect it to PCIe bus. It has 492 general I.O. pins that can be used for data inputs and outputs. Also, it has 12 memory controllers that can be used to connect to different memory chips. Overall, the advantage of FPGAs include the high density to create complex functions, it can integrate as many functions as long as the as long as the FPGA resources is capable to support them. And these designs can have access to different I/O standards and features, and with direct access to data, because data can go directly from I/O to computation engine and back out all in one chip.